Thank you. <clears throat> uh, good morning, Udian. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Uh, how are you? How are you? Very good. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Okay. How's uh, London? And has any economic activities picked up there? Well, we had an announcement um, over the weekend, and then obviously yesterday, where the, the matter went to Parliament around okay. the easing of the uh, the lockdown. So I think we're in now moving into the next phase of the easing of the lockdown. I think okay. children will go back to school over the course of June, and by the end of June, they want all children back in school, and then. Uh, further easing into July, so I think we're doing a phased easing approach here. Um, it'll probably oh. take us into August, September, but uh, there's at least the first signs of the easing. Oh, that's that's nice. Good to hear, Rudyan, and all the best out there. Um, so, Rudyan, uh, good to have you again in our COVID-10 special value series. <clears throat> Today, our topic of discussion is emerging themes for banks and fintech collaboration in the next normal, that is the post-COVID era. Uh, we have this uh, special show every day Udian, with SMEs from the financial world, very subject matter experts. This is our way of showing solidarity along with you and others from the financial industry. So welcome to the show once again. Thank you. Udian uh, and all participants here as well as from other social media channels are present. So there is, uh, uh, there is participation from and not only this this channel, but also from other social media channels. <clears throat> uh, so a brief about Udyan. Uh, Udyan has been a keen proponent of the fast changing landscape of uh, financial services. Uh, he uh, fell into the intersection of financial services and technology well before the term uh, FinTech you know, came into being um, uh, or was coined. He has traversed the gr uh, growth market when they were called the frontier markets, you know, these, these are all terminologies uh, we use in the financial industries. So uh, Udayan is the co-founder uh, of Apis and uh, Anthemis Group, the first specialist global investor in fintech based in London, where he made 32 investments, including well-known names such as Simple, Betterment and Trow. He was also the global head of financial technology advisor at Deutsche Bank. He's, I think today we have him, we are lucky to have him. He's best suited to speak on banks and fintech collaboration. I'm sure we all are going to have a great session with Udayan. Uh, Udayan, welcome once again. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so the, the Cap Gemini report 2020 uh, sees a new operating paradigm and a lot more collaboration with big tech, you know, uh, big technology companies. As you know, Apple is working with Goldman Sachs. Amazon is working with uh, Chase. Uh, Google is uh, working with Citi. Uh, so post-COVID, collaboration between banks and fintechs is inevitable, isn't it? Yeah, so I think, look, <clears throat> I think uh, the first thing you need to note is that um, this is an exceptional moment. Um, yeah, this, absolutely. Uh, I, I would say that people are now calling it the largest black swan event of our lifetimes. I think that's probably accurate. Uh, from an indicator perspective, the indicators are significantly more uh, serious than the indicators we had in precedent crises. So whether you want to talk about the 2008 financial crisis, the 2000 technology crisis, yeah. in fact, yeah. even all the way back to the oil crisis in the 70s, I think probably our closest um, analogy is the, the late 20s depression that from 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 an indicator perspective i okay. think the real the, there's a very very large difference between what happened then and what's happening now and the, that difference is that technology has moved on a generation or maybe two and so we are in a very different space um, and what the crisis has really highlighted um, has been two things uh, one is that we have been moving into um, the digital world uh, as a world. We had been moving into a digital world. Some countries and some societies were further advanced uh, into the digital world and some were less advanced. Yeah. The issue with the crisis in my mind was it highlighted that divide very significantly. So the digital divide was something that is actually deepened the divide between the haves and the have-nots. 
Mm. And that has a consequence. And that consequence is to say that in order to narrow the divide, you need to bring the people who are outside the digital divide into the digital yeah. world. And so that is actually probably the single biggest driver that's going to drive banks, traditional financial institutions, others to embrace digital in an accelerated fashion. But in order to embrace digital in an accelerated fashion, they need to collaborate with people who have best in class technology and best in class best practice around digital. And those tend to be the earlier stage financial technology companies. And so this crisis has almost necessitated the use of such technology um, and has necessitated the banks uh, and other financial services companies to really rethink their strategy around collaboration in order to drive further inclusion, financial inclusion through digital means. Okay. So uh, globally and particularly in India, uh, what, uh, according to you, uh, uh, will be the COVID, uh, uh, post-COVID, uh, what are the things that it underscores uh, uh, to, to the need for collaborative partnership between banks and fintech? So actually, it's interesting. This is a topic that I've been talking about um, in various forums for the last three or four years. Yeah. Um, and and it, it's really, uh, uh, it's really uh, centered around something called contextual financial services. So if one, uh, you know, you know, you don't wake up in the morning saying, yeah. I, I would like to buy a loan, or you don't wake up in the morning and say, you know, I'd like to get a savings account. I think what you wake up in the morning is with a need. The need may be that you want to buy a house or you want to buy a car. And somehow you want to finance that purchase of a car or house. Or the need may be that you want to somehow diversify your investments and yeah. get a return on your investment. So that would require a brokerage account or savings account. So the point there is that we, uh, as human beings, we don't consume, really, we don't consume products anymore. There was a time when the world was a, driven on a product-centric approach. We are now driven on an experience-centric approach. And yeah. so the embedding of financial, and that's particularly acute in a digital world. So the embedding of finance into experiences is something that was a trend line that started a number of years ago as we started to share data between platforms. That was increasing. I mean, the last topic I spoke about in this forum was open banking. That increasingly, that's been, a, that's been accelerated by the open banking movement. The open banking movement has allowed people to take disparate sources of data and mix them with financial data to provide more customized products, to embed those products within, let's say, a car purchase. So you could buy a car and you have an embedded loan in there. You have an embedded insurance product in there for the insurance for the car. You know, you, you, can, you can do that. So, so that, that has already accelerated um, that the, the embedding of finance uh, within, within um, products. And as a result of that, the, uh, what, what, what people were doing was rebuilding architecture within banks and within uh, financial services companies to take advantage of that situation. Uh, they were either rebuilding it because they saw it coming or they were rebuilding it because of regulation, because open banking for payment services directed to force them to do that. Mm -hmm. At the same time today, the ownership of customers in a digital world and as we move into digital world, is yeah. largely becoming the domain of the technology platforms. Now, you talked about the Amazon collaborating with Berkshire Hathaway around insurance, Amazon collaborating with JP Morgan around current accounts, uh, Apple collaborating with Goldman Sachs around the Apple card. These are all examples of financial services companies who have come to the realization that they can no longer either acquire customers or maintain customer ownership on their own because yeah. the primary touch point for customers is very quickly moving to the large digital platforms in the, in the Americas and the American centric world. It's the FANGs, the Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Googles, uh, et cetera. In the, on, on the other side of the world, on the China centric world, 
It's the bats, the ba Badi, uh, the Baidu Alibaba Tencent complex. Yeah. So yeah. You have these two complexes of very large technology companies. That so these large technology companies are either doing a open, what we call a very open collaboration with companies to access. So the one that's probably most in the Chinese are very open in their approach to allowing ecosystems to build up and, and access to customers through their platforms where they control the customer interface, but they provide multiple products mm -hmm. to their customers. That's on the one side. Um, and on the other side, you, you know, you have semi open loop structures, such as the one that Amazon has created with Berkshire Hathaway or Apple has created with, 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 with Goldman, which where they, there's more of a siloed approach to data until of course the time that that data opens up. So this is something that obviously uh, is going to continuously happen. And as we move into a, a more digital world and that digital world will be driven by what we call now the, what this new phrase that seems to be coming along, which is the low touch economy as a result of COVID. Um, so the need to do things in a way that doesn't require a physical interface. And the only way to do that is through digital. And so there are many areas that need to develop their authentication, customer identity, uh, many of those things. That being said, you mentioned the Capgemini report um, and that study that recently was released, you know, revealed several very acute pain points for financial services uh, institutions. One is that only 21% of banks uh, say that their systems are agile enough for collaboration because in order to collaborate, you must have, you have to have built APIs, you have to have built interfaces that allow uh, third parties to access data and other systems in order to provide a collaborative product or some sort of exp embedded experience to your customer. Uh, that, uh, you know, we touched on that a little bit in the context of open banking and companies that are building those interfaces on behalf of banks the last time. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's correct. Then in terms of measurement, only 6% of banks have achieved the desired return on investment from this sort of collaboration. So the early results have not been good, but I expect those to accelerate significantly in this new world. Um, and 70% of the financial technology companies themselves see a misalignment in the cultural and other values with their bank partners. And I have experienced this firsthand. Banks and other financial services companies generally have a very dogmatic approach to customer ownership where they believe they need to own the customer in order to provide a service. And the new world says that that is a fallacy. It is very hard to do that. Uh, because, as I mentioned to you before, if you go to Indonesia, the primary touch point for a customer into financial services is through GoCheck or Grab, because that's where their primary relationship is. And the, they are become the platforms to provide financial services to customers. So it's, it's becoming very, very uh, different. One of the roles I have is, is uh, as an institution that we have, is we help co-manage Standard Charters Corporate Venture Fund. And one of the key things there was to, to invest in financial technology companies that uh, basically brought some form of collaboration to Standard Chartered in, in terms of driving. That's been interesting because we see uh, areas where there's been very interesting, great collaboration, uh, and there've been areas where it's been very, very difficult to do. So you start to see that. So I think that we will see uh, an acceleration here, um, but it will require banks to embrace digital in a way that they haven't embraced it before. They've really played largely lip service to digital. They haven't become digitally, what we call digitally native yet. And, and I think that's where it's going to become interesting. Excellent. <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, the exciting times are coming uh, because as you say, customers are likely not to be owned by the banks and you know, some other fintech or third parties. And that's a huge shift by itself, you know. Uh, we had some other people talking about it, saying that the, uh, the uh, traditional banking will be there, but the tradition banks perhaps will collapse if in the post-COVID era. Uh, you, you agree with that, uh, Udayan? I think collapse is a big word. Um, okay. The, the, I, I think... Look, I think any institution that has significant scale 
um, will yeah. survive through this. And and I, I think I, th I think the the way you need to think about this is you need to think about the role of the 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 traditional banks and financial services in the value chain. So we talked a little bit a little bit earlier about technology companies. Technology companies are, in my mind, going to be in the front face of distribution and customer interface. So okay. they're the ones who are going to be touching the customer. Then in between the technology companies and the traditional banks, you'll have the fintechs who are essentially product providers, specialist product providers. So they were, but they will not have balance sheet. Balance sheet is going to become the domain of the traditional pro, uh, financial services companies because they're highly regulated institutions. Philosophically, yeah. if an institution touches money, it needs to be regulated. Why is Absolutely. that? That is because yeah. ultimately the taxpayer is the backstop for any financial institution's uh, survival. If a bank goes bust in any country, ultimately the government steps in either directly because there's a deposit insurance scheme or indirectly because they cannot have a run on banks and that creates a confidence issue. So philosophically, those institutions always need to be regulated. The cost of regulation and, and the intensity of regulation means that you need to have a certain scale. So it'll be large scale institutions that will survive to become balance sheet providers or balance sheet repositories to this new value chain. And that's the way you need to think about, I think this way, certainly I think about this new value chain. Now keep in mind that what that means is that if you're subscale, I think it's very difficult to survive. Mm -hmm. You start to okay. see that even in India with the NBFCs. I think subscale NBFCs will have an incredibly difficult time to survive because in a sense, they are, they are also in a disaggregated value chain because an NBFC focuses on the asset side, not on the liability side. The yeah. liability side, they get through the wholesale market or through relationships with, with other balance sheet providers. And those balance sheet providers will not work with large enough would not work with subscale NBFCs because of the diversification issue on the asset side yeah. and because of the scale issue. And so this is, a, this is going to play out in all parts of the value chain. The only part of the value chain, frankly, that could survive in a niche manner and actually is suited to the niche manner is the fintech companies themselves that are the product manufacturers that are then going through the distributors that are the technology companies and using the balance sheets that are the traditional financial services companies. So, yeah. so this is the sort of continuum that, that, that you're going to, you're, you're largely going to start to see, um, you know, as a result of, you know, this kind of acceleration of a trend that was already there. Okay. Yeah. Great. I think this, uh, exciting times coming up uh, with a complete change. So you see that as a complete disruptive shift that's going to happen uh, in the days to come. And uh, so uh, how will that uh, kind of affect banking? You know, I mean, will, it, will that be a complete uh, shift? Uh, could, you, uh, could you elaborate a couple of more things on how the acceleration of the second wave of digital 2.0 will happen? Yeah, so I, I look, I think I want to I want to overlay um, I want to overlay another concept here because I think it's very relevant to this question. Sure, sure, absolutely. And that and that question is um, is um, general purpose technologies, right? So, yeah. so uh, one of my collaborators and somebody I worked with, a wonderful lady called Carlota Perez. She's written some great books, um, and and I think uh, you know Carlota's thesis, which is a thesis that uh, we see um, in, 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 in many different um, aspects is basically that historically technological revolutions uh, arrive with remarkable regularity and that economies react to them in very predictable phases, right? So we have these waves of technology that come in um, and she's written a fantastic book if you haven't read it called, you know, Technological Revolutions and Financial Capital where you have these bubbles and golden ages where, you know, with, with, with great regularity. Now, one of the uh, things- for, for, the, for the purpose of participants, could you just re, uh, uh, say the name of the title of the book? And yeah, the name it's, again? Called, um, it, it's Carlotta per Perez, and uh, the book is called Technological Revolutions and Financial Capital, The Dynamics Thanks. of Bubbles and Golden Ages. Thank you. And, and so the 
So what you see, uh, what you've seen with general purpose technologies, there have been four broad general purpose technologies, um, in, you know, in the recent history. I'm not going to go back to the Stone Ages where, you know, for example, uh, iron was a general purpose technology, right? So I'm not going to go all the way back, there, but I'm going to go to the more, the, the one in the last 500 years, right? Or three, 400 years. Yeah? The first one was the steam yeah. engine, which then drove the industrial revolution. Um, the second one uh, was electricity, which was in the early part of the century, which then created electrification of the world, uh, except, you know, and, and essentially drove a very, very large uh, uh, growth. The third one was information technology, which started with companies like IBM and others in the late 60s and then got and then we moved into the information technology level. The fourth was the internet, and you know where we are, yeah. the internet. And today we yeah. have a fifth one. Absolutely. And that fifth one is artificial intelligence and robotic process automation, which is coming into the world. Okay. Okay, okay. now each of these general purpose technologies have had a very significant effect on the way we do business, the way we think about business, the way, the, the way, the, the way we are structured from an economic perspective. And and what's also interesting as an aside in, in this is that the superpowers that arose from each of these technologies largely changed with each one. So if you think about the Industrial Revolution, that was the rise of the European uh, superpowers. So you had the United Kingdom, that yeah. was a European superpower that grew up from that. When we got into electrification, it was interestingly enough the rise of the United States and the Soviet Union. One of the things people don't realize is that the first paper Stalin wrote when he took over the the, the former USSR, Russia, yeah, uh, was that his single biggest onus in terms of development for that country was to electrify the entire Soviet Union. That ele electrification movement then put the Soviet Union to build the so the industrial complex it built, which put it in, in as a superpower across the opposite side from the United States at the time and the Cold War came. Then came the yeah. uh, information technology revolution, which put America pretty much ahead, um, you know, in terms of global superpowers and has sustained it today through the internet. Now with AI, before COVID, both the Chinese premier and Putin both talk extensively and where they're putting all of their money is into artificial intelligence because they recognize that that is the next chief general purpose technology which will propel whoever is at the leadership of that into the next superpower and this is all now getting accelerated through covid and through digitization and i and i mention all of this because coming back to your question about what does this mean for the banks and the, the traditional banks one of yeah. the things that the banks and the, the traditional banks are going to do is is in order to be a efficient scale operations and and operators of balance sheet they need to drive uh, very efficient operations, and that efficient operation will be driven through robotic process automation um, and through the adoption of artificial intelligence. Um, and so, and that is because the core raw material for yeah. banks is data. Their raw material yes. isn't something they're bringing out of the ground. Their raw material isn't something that is pumped out of the ground, you know, to drive the analogy, the, the, the raw material is data. And in order to process data faster, better, you know, more efficiently, you are going to adopt robotic process automation. That's to make your systems very efficient uh, and to drive uh, straight through processing um, and uh, artificial intelligence. And so these are gonna become very integral to strategy. That has the result that banks will, unfortunately, and this is something we're gonna have to face in a world of AI, um, reduce the number of people in those institutions because automation will replace those number of peoples. Um, and uh, if they don't embrace that, and if they don't do that, and if they don't, then they risk becoming themselves obsolete. And so we're going to see that starting to happen. Um, and this will, I think, become pretty much the new normal in the next three to 12 to 18 months. Um, so, so, so I think this is sort of some of the things that we're starting to think about and see, and some of the things that the, these institutions need to think about. Okay, thank you so much. Very, very nice. And so like I've been saying, it's like exciting times coming up for fintech companies. 
uh, uh, just uh, just a reminder to all the participants once again that you can ask your uh, questions uh, to the end through the Q and A. Uh, I will also be opening up uh, the uh, uh, for direct questions from you to the end. You've got to raise your hands, and the back office will identify you and will uh, you know uh, will uh, enable you to ask the question directly. So please send your questions uh, to the Q and A, and I can take it as much as possible uh, to uh, Udayan. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, Udiyan, just going to the next uh, point is that I know, uh, about the collaboration, you know, uh, and partnership that uh, some of the banks have had before, but beyond a flurry of uh, press and, uh, you know, public uh, kind of getting the, getting the name published, do you, have you seen partnerships with banks in fintechs? Have they worked? Uh, and if and what kind of partnership will work according to you? So I, I first say I think there's a prerequisite in in order for uh, this is by the way uh, in order for any partnership to work, but particularly for in order for a partnership uh, in this particular instance to work, you need to um, you need to be very clear. Both partners need to be very clear in their minds what the roles and responsibilities of each partner. And what their what are, what what the expectation is to what they deliver. The problem with most yeah. of these fintech uh, partnerships is that there is a misunderstanding between the roles and responsibilities of, let's say, the financial institution partner and the fintech partner. The single biggest misunderstanding tends to be around, as I talked about earlier, customer ownership. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think uh, the banks and financial services companies need to rethink the definition of customer ownership. It cannot be that they believe that they have a unilateral right to own the customer anymore. Because actually, it is not their decision anymore. In the world of open data, it is the decision of the customer, of how the customer wants to be owned, so to speak. Do they want other people to have the data? And then they get give access to that data, and therefore the ownership paradigm changes dramatically. So I think that that's, you know, that at the core of it, that's where, where you are able, where your part, the partnership is able to very clearly understand the roles and responsibilities of either side. That's where you have very successful partnerships. Probably the ones you mentioned earlier are the most successful that we're starting to see. The Apple Goldman Sachs partnership around the Apple card is a very successful partnership because Goldman is not interested in owning the customer. Goldman is interested in aggregating assets through okay. the the, uh, the card and then putting those assets in order to make a spread against the liabilities that it brings. It's very clear in its mind. That's what it wants to do. Apple is a, a company that is wants to deliver the best product to its customer. Yeah. but doesn't necessarily want to leverage the data that's sitting through that product delivery because it has a different approach to 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 data privacy etc because it believes that its brand becomes stronger through the yeah. delivery of very high quality product to its customers so i think when people really understand the roles and responsibilities within the value chain people start to uh, understand very very quickly you know how to make these partnerships extremely successful, and so this is this is I would say this is really um, how people need to think about this. Um, I think that in financial services it is incredibly important to do this, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll give you an example based on numbers. So um, the entire uh, wealth and protection ecosystem. Yeah. in the United States in 2025, according to McKinsey, uh, will be worth about $1.1 or $1.2 trillion as a revenue. Yeah. The revenue pool for the housing market is, for the same period, is about $6 trillion, which is about, let's say, five times or five and a half times the size of the financial service. If you can collaborate as a financial services company into the housing ecosystem, by, for example, embedding mortgages rather than selling them as a separate product, you increase your overall revenue pool from that $1.1 trillion into something that's going into and taking away revenue from the $6 trillion. 
And so this collaborative approach has a very strong economic incentive. And that is in every different ecosystem, whether it's mobility, because that's another ecosystem which is yeah. far larger than the yeah. financial yeah. services ecosystem, whether it's healthcare and health tech, which is a place we're playing a lot, which is the intersection between healthcare and insurance. In all of these, there's a very, very strong uh, onus to do it. And so yeah. this is, there's a very strong economic incentive for people to do this. And, 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 you know, with competition intensifying and with the tech companies getting very involved in, in, in this space, these sorts of, the, the, this sort of thought process and thinking is going to become very, very important. Go ahead, then. So, so I think that's. I, 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 does that does that answer the question, or I'm just yeah, trying to? Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. So I thought I thought uh, it abruptly stopped. So I thought you were Sorry. something. No, no problems. So I think what you are touching touching upon is one major shift that's uh, that's going to happen, is that the customer uh, need not be owned by the bank, you know, and that's a major shift that we're going to see in the post COVID era. Uh, so you mentioned about uh, the way it is working in, in Indonesia, yeah, and uh, you mentioned a couple of uh, product, couple of fintech companies. Uh, are they the touch points? Are they the uh, they own the customers then? Yeah, they own the customers. So if you look at the let's say Grab, which is a Uber-like app app in Indonesia, which is the dom I think is the dominant app app in Indonesia, for example. Okay. If you go onto the Grab uh, or the Go Check, which are the two. If you go onto the Grab. Um, Per screen, mobility is like one of eight menu choices. Yeah. So you'll have mobility, you'll have shopping, you'll have so e-commerce shopping, you'll have, and then you'll have insurance, you'll have savings. Yeah. The guys, who, the guys who really pioneered this was the Chinese, through mm -hmm. the Chinese platform. So the WeChat, so WeChat, through uh, through its money market fund, is the single largest aggregator of money market deposits in the world. I think you know I, I don't remember the exact number, but it's a very 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 large number. Um, so, uh, literally, the uh, the Chinese use the social media platforms to manage their savings. They don't yeah. use traditional financial services companies anymore. And this is pretty much the same that's happening across Asia. Yeah. So, 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 so this, so yes, the customer interface and the customer ownership, because at the end of the day, um, as a person, how often do you engage with your bank or your insurance company? If you let's let's take the extreme example, life insurance. The only time yeah. you engage with your life insurance company is the time you buy your life insurance policy. Yeah. Every yeah. so often when you have to remember to pay it, because most of the time it's paid automatically, or when you die. Yeah. That's your engagement touch points, right? Correct. With your bank account, the only time you really engage with your bank account is either you're putting money in or you're using your card or you're taking money out. With um, let's just take with a mobility application. Every time you engage with your customer, every time you engage with the product is, or, or the platform is, every time you need to move from A to B. Which one yeah. has a higher frequency? Obviously, the third one. So it's where the highest frequency of interaction is, is where the logical touch point yeah. is to be able to manage. And then, if you can manage your savings on the same place that you manage your mobility as a human being, you like simplicity. And so you're going to start to rethink yeah, yeah. measures. So this is, you know, this is customer behavior changing. Oh, correct. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, let me take a couple of questions on the end and uh, we get uh, the first question from uh, YouTube. Uh, the uh, YouTuber, if I may call him, uh, says that, uh, ask you a question, do you expect customers shift from product to experience uh, given opportunity to telecom companies to become major partner for the FI to reach out to the customers for business opportunities. Um, yes and no. Um, so okay. good, very good question. Yes and no, yeah. because the telcos are are very much thinking uh, are very much thinking about it. The, yeah. the ones that are most advanced in this thinking, interesting enough, are the ones in Africa, because uh -huh. they've mobile money infrastructures in Africa. So Safaricom, which is the largest yeah. telco in Kenya, built M-Pesa, which many of you may have heard of. And, yeah. and today M-Pesa is the dominant payment provider um, and, and, and actually, you know, customer interface point, but it's getting embedded into everything um, in Kenya. So, so many have. However, okay. keep in mind the following. Um, the world, most countries will institute um, um, 
data neutrality or platform neutrality. What does that mean? That means that you can't do what Facebook tried to do in India a few years ago, which is uh, try and control a pipe to the customer, data pipe to the customer by, by mm -hmm. actually selectively controlling access to content. I think most regulators will reject that. So what that means okay. is that telcos will continue to what we call dumb pipes. It means they cannot control the data that flows through their pipe to you as a customer. Yeah. What, what they can do is they can, let's say when they sell you a phone, they can selectively put applications on that phone as a way to induce you to use those applications. Okay. And I think that's where the leading, that's where a lot of the telcos are thinking about playing because they own the first screen that they you open when you open up your smartphone with the pre-installed applications, just like Apple has pre-installed applications on the iPhone. And so if you put yeah. the right applications there, they can they can use that as a way to bring customers onto the platform. So, so, so that's the yeah. way the telcos are. Now, some telcos are going a little bit further and they are either setting up subsidiaries that are in the financial services space, or they are investing in or they're investing in financial services companies in order to yeah. play play the larger part of the value chain. But the but the experience for telcos there has been largely a difficult one. Telcos are not banks. Telcos don't want to be regulated like banks or financial services companies. So that's yeah. so they are actually now actively moving towards a partnership model. And I think that's where we will see the telcos go. The telcos will go to a partnership model. The telcos have an economic yeah. necessity to go down the partnership model. Because yeah. data and voice, voice is already massively commoditized, virtually free, and yeah. data is becoming virtually free. So they got to make money on value added services and the value added services that they will make money on. The largest uh, revenue point for value added services for that will be in the financial services. Space. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, the second question, I think it's a kind of relative question. In the era of a bank fintech partnership, we talked about bank and fintech partnership that's going to happen. Um, how important is your partner's relationship with the regulators? Also, the skill of combating frauds, as we believe the number of frauds are also likely to increase. So, um, uh, uh, the uh, relationship with regulators is extremely important generally, right, of course. But remember that most, the, the more enlightened fintechs and my, my uh, as I talked about a lot earlier, will try to keep a very light touch regulatory structure where the regulatory structure will light touch. And that light touch regulatory structure will largely be based on data privacy because the, the commodity that they are using or the, uh, the, the, the raw material, as I talked about earlier, that they're using is data. And, and the regulators are going to become yeah. very concerned and very focused on data privacy. And so I think yeah. the real challenge for them is going to be making sure the, that they keep, that they use the data with appropriate permissioning from the end customer. They safeguard the data from breaches and others. And this comes to the point that was raised around the cyber, uh, the, 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 the issue of cybersecurity and security and all of that. And that's a very important part of, of, yeah. of the equation. Um, and they are going to be resp responsible for the protection of any output of that data in an appropriate fashion. So, you know, so, so pulling in the data requires appropriate permissions, holding and processing the data requires yeah. appropriate permissions. One of the things with holding and processing the data is a lot of governments are moving towards what's called data localization. That means you cannot offshore the data and process it offshore and then bring it back onshore for, for privacy, regulatory, privacy, uh, sorry, privacy, regulatory and security reasons. Um, and then as you take the data out, the interface point to whoever's using the data, let's say the technology company, because you, let's say you're in this collaborative ecosystem, yeah. you need yeah. to make sure that it doesn't leak on the way out. Yeah. And so, so the, the, you know, these are sorts of the sorts of things that are going to become important for the companies and important from their in, in their discussions with the regulators. So, the, so they will be. I think yeah. traditional financial services regulation is largely going to go back to the domain of the people who are holding the money or touching the money. 
because it's inappropriate to apply that kind of regulation to somebody who doesn't touch the money itself. They're merely being facilitators yeah. within the flow. So, so I think that's my view on that. Right. I think, uh, I think we've, we've got to see a lot of changes happening. Uh, you know, you touched upon banks, you touched upon fintech companies, touched upon mobile operators. I think that's, uh, that's where I see a lot of collaborations happening. Uh, so uh, if these are the kind of collaborations happening and, and as you say, uh, banks are not necessarily going to be owning data or owning the customer. So are you saying, I mean, uh, you know, to put it uh, very bluntly, that uh, banks will be only a place to get, to take money and to give money. And the, the cash, that being cash being the only, uh, one of the only things that they do. Um, look, I think um, the... Uh, so it's a shift. <laughs> Yeah, there's a shift. So yeah. yes, take money, obviously invest that money. So that's how you yeah. manage manage it on the, so there's a liability side, there's an asset side. Yes. There's a risk management function that sits in between. The risk yeah. management function makes sure that the asset side is diverse enough that you don't have, you don't take significant risk. And your liability side is diverse enough that you don't have liquidity risk, right? Yeah. This is what banks, this is basically what the core function of a bank, right? Yes. Now, um, the, the, the big shift is going to be that banks before, you, you need to think about it like um, car manufacturing in the 50s. 1950, the world's largest car company was a company called General Motors. Nice. Yes. Yeah. General Motors in the 50s um, used to own steel plants because and used to own the dealership. So it was a fully vertically integrated end-to-end -end institution. It would make the steel, press the steel, assemble the cars, make, manufacture all the components of the car, market the car, sell it to you in a dealership and service the car. Complete end-to-end -end ownership of this value chain, right? This is General Motors in the 50s. Today, no car company in the world does any of that. Car companies are a little bit like Apple. They are design and marketing companies. So if you're Toyota or if you're Chrysler or if you're any one of these things, you outsource pretty much everything in your value chain. You outsource, you don't make your own steel, you buy the steel. You don't make any of the parts in your car. You design them and then you outsource them to a car part manufacturer who will then manufacture it and then deliver it to you. You'll assemble it. And then you don't do the you 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 don't you you do some of the broad marketing, and then you have dealers that are franchise dealers that sell sell the sell the cars out and service the cars. So they essentially design uh, design marketing companies. So you can see how the value chain has dramatically changed in that. Yeah. And I think it's going to be exactly the same. It's going to be the same that banks will lose control of parts of so they will lose control of distribution as you talk about. They will yeah. no longer yeah. own the customer. They will lose control of manufacturing because that's going to go into specialist manufacturers, fintech manufacturers, scale manufacturers. They will continue to own the wholesale side, which is the balance sheets, both, both sides of the balance sheet. The risk management becomes a, a core competency. And they, will, they may continue to own the liability aggregation feature, which is deposit taking, because that's a highly um, regulated industry, and rightly so. So, so you're going to start to see that, that very much that stratification. So I'm, uh, I, I, I think I hopefully I've kind of covered that, that question. Yeah, thanks. So. Uh, go ahead, Rudhya. No, no, nothing for me. Um, I, okay, I, I cool. Really okay. The next part. okay, good, good. So uh, we did talk about um, mobile. And, you know, we have seen how things uh, from a from a delivery point of view. Uh, whether it's customer uh, services delivery or uh, any other, uh, any of those delivery points have really uh, been accelerated by the by the advent of 3G and 4G, and now you have 5G coming mid time, right? Or it's already coming. Uh, so, do you think uh, there is uh, a lot more uh, to happen between uh, banks and the fintech and mobile operators? Um, around 5G. So look, I think um, it's um, it's 
an interesting question. Does 5G uh, impact the, this ecosystem? Um, uh, fundamentally, the, the recipe was already yeah. there. It's not that we didn't have connectivity. What 5G does yeah. is improve connectivity yeah. significantly. As a result of improving connectivity and data speeds, data fidelity, the ability for people to access networks, it improves people's access to everything digital, right? Everything digital, your, your access is improved as a result of having better bandwidth, basically, right? The, the more bandwidth you have, the more you can consume from a digital perspective. You know, it's a little bit like, you know, the, the bigger your pipe at home, you know, the more water you can use. Um, and so, um, what it does is it, it, it makes access ubiquitous. What that means is that you have many, many, many more people who are digitally native because they have access to digital. And that opens up the customer universe. And that obviously yeah. deepens that. But this comes back to what I said right at the beginning, COVID and what we're going through is really going to accelerate the move to digital. And this, this is an enabler to, of that acceleration in the move to it doesn't necessarily change the fundamental situation that exists today. Yeah. It, it merely creates a better tool to get it done faster. Yeah. True. So uh, uh, come back to the earlier uh, you know, talk we had on uh, uh, customers uh, with the bank. So with these changes that, uh, that uh, we are going to foresee and, uh, and the collaborations that are going to happen around, uh, are you going to do you see a switching of loyalties from customers uh, of banks to somewhere else? I mean, will that shift happen quickly? Yes, yeah, you will see that. I think you're starting to see that already. Um, I think you're starting to see that in um, in Europe, where either their customers just bypass banks altogether in their first relationship, um, a little bit like. You know, for those of you who remember, I grew up in India, in, in Delhi, and, uh, and, and you know, when I was growing up, if I wanted to talk to my relatives in, in the U.S. Or, or wherever they were, or anybody who was outside of India, you, um, you picked up the phone and you booked a trunk call. And then, and, and then you know, at yeah. some point in the day, at 2 o'clock at the appointed time, normally not on time, the operator would call you and say, I'm connecting your trunk call to it. Washington. And then you'd have your discussion and that's how you do it, right? And then there's an entire generation who never used fixed lines at all. They just went straight to mobile phones. They don't even know what a fixed line looks like in India, right? There's an entire generation who have no idea what a fixed line is. That experience is alien to them, right? And it's much the same here. What's, there's going to be an entire generation that won't know what a bank is because they'll move directly into embedded finance through the technology company. Right? And that's, that, that leapfrogging Absolutely. is real. And so, so I think that's, that's, I mean, whether a customer who's been with a bank for 35 years, you know, in a different generation is going to move suddenly to a technology company. Yes, maybe, maybe they don't, but does that even matter? The question is, what is this new yeah. generation doing, right? And I think this new generation yeah. leapfrogs. True, true. So you know uh, when you say that the that the that the customer is not with the bank, and uh, but the money is with the bank, that brings in uh, another factor: data security. You know, so how is data security uh, going to be handled when we say that the ownership and the money lies with different entities? So I that's the role. That's partially the role of the regulator. Yeah. Um, the regulator, and in many countries now, you have special data regulators that have that have been instituted. Yeah. Uh, so that is the role of the regulator. The regulator's role is to institute stringent security protocols and criteria that okay. uh, that have to be instituted to allow either the pulling or pushing of customer data, so that yeah. they're so that that data is kept secure. Um, that is the role uh, of having appropriate penalties and sanctions against those who do not provide adequate customer security from a data perspective. Yeah. So any data breaches are appropriately dealt with from, and so that makes it serious that if people don't build appropriate security infrastructure, yeah. then uh, they should not have access to data and they should not be allowed to participate in it. And I think that's how we'll build it, build it around. 
actually in a funny way it's not something that india is uh, is alien to because aadhar is pretty much built on the same concepts yeah aadhar is you know if you think about aadhar aadhar is a potentially a massive data uh it, a potentially a massive opportunity for um criminals to access very very critical data because of identity is at the core of everything we do and in the digital world identity is everything yeah um, and and so it's a but you've set up an infrastructure which allows you to access other in a way that is secure um, yeah. and protects people's identities and their biometric information appropriately and it's going to be pretty much the same so yeah. i think this is a very regulatory driven aspect true true Uh, but within coming to the uh, the indian context where you know people are used to uh, being physically going down to the banks you know doing physical mode of transactions and with such a large population and um, many of them still use feature phones uh, you uh, i mean how long i mean do you think that these kind of changes uh, would happen uh, pretty quickly uh, in a country like india um i think they do um they do for a number of reasons one is smartphone penetration in india was already accelerating um yeah. dramatically um yes. even yes. before covid um i think it's over 50% now which it wasn't before um but uh, this is something that that uh, that is uh, is a very very um, important so i think uh, today smartphone penetration is around a little bit over 50% as of that's the latest stats um and it will continue to to increase so so that's number one so secondly you may have seen uh, the massive investment over the last few weeks by foreign capital coming into geo right yeah so yeah, yeah. Number of very large investors coming into geo yes um and that is in anticipation of this trend line of this the digitization trend line because that investment and that money coming in is basically there so that you can have a ubiquitous network and then the second part of that is that that the companies will push out smartphones um through financed embedded finance coming back to the point around embedded finance which you start to see quite a bit to the customers who are on those networks and so okay. i do see the trend very significant you're starting to see that already i mean the these large investments into by facebook into geo and by you know silver lake into geo and others is is really a, is really uh a sign of this already accelerating so so absolutely okay yeah maybe maybe it'll take a little time but i think uh, this is inevitable of uh, you know uh, moving into the new way of uh, doing business uh you know uh, uh, banks as you know within we had generally been this uh, front middle and back office has been the trend that has been going on though some of them have kind of diluted these uh will this uh, kind of model continue or will it uh, uh will will die down so you mean the model of the 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 the, the banks work work in front of... yeah front office middle office back office you know we have this look i think if you for certain banks of course it will continue right you'll have uh, if you're very very large if you're state bank of india sure yeah i mean you're huge right uh, you, you will continue or if you're city bank or if you're but for any uh, sub scale institution i think they're going to have to pick what they do yeah, they can't yeah. be they can't be all things to everybody yeah. uh, and that's that's the, that's the nature of this scale game that i talked about you know earlier on um in, yeah. in in order to be a player you either got to be a niche player or you got to be a large player you can't be somewhere in between right so, so you know so either you become a specialist mortgage bank which mm-hmm. a lot of people do or a specialist you know sme lending bank and that's all you do or you got to play this 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 entire ecosystem to to actually you know get get your balance sheet of the right size okay thanks uh so participants uh, we we can now have a, a direct question to odian if uh, anybody wants to ask could you please put up your hand and the back office will enable you to ask a question Hello. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Tell your name yeah. and go ahead. So, yeah. So I'm Tyag here. Uh, the question is uh, India is a highly regulated payment market. 
the policy, regulatory, and compliance uh, disruptions are taking a huge toll that is dent in the revenues of payment companies. Do you see a congenial atmosphere created for companies with prior consultation by the regulatory and other policy uh, makers? And what is your uh, take on this and this is your global experience? It's a great question. So um, my take on this is, uh, a, is, is a philosophical take, which is at the cornerstone of what, what's going on around the world. And that philosophical take is that in the near term, near to medium term, you cannot make money on payments. Payments is a facilitating transaction to move money from A to B. What blockchain and the blockchain protocol has shown is that there is zero friction really with the right technology to move money from A to B, right? What the banks and the financial services companies in the last 100, 100, 200 years or whatever it was have been doing is they make money off friction. And that's the friction of moving money from A to B. And that's what they're making money. And that's typically, and, and that friction is generated by information asymmetry. But as we move into highly connected uh, uh, and, and real time connected uh, countries, markets, people through all the things we talked about data and everything, that there is no need for that friction to exist. That friction existed as a bridge to manage risk through the information asymmetry. So you, my going in assertion here is that you cannot make money on payments. And what the Indian regulator, and I think it's been pioneering regulator in this perspective, um, has done is it's taken that friction out of the system by creating very efficient mechanisms to move payments initially through IMPS, the NPCI IMPS system, and now through uh, subsequent UPI and other systems. Um, and, and that's taken obviously the revenue that people used to make out of that friction. Um, where you can make money is through value added services. That value added service includes risk management. So if you're providing credit to somebody, you're taking risk and you get a return on the risk. If you're doing other services to that customer, you can make money on that customer. And therefore, a, a, uh, your, your business and revenue model as a payment company cannot be to charge for payments in the medium to long, because that will disappear. You have to be thinking yeah. about how you charge for other aspects around the payment transaction. And so this is my belief. And my belief is that this will continue, whether there's consultation with the industry or not, it doesn't matter. I think the direction is very clear. The direction is to take that friction out and to make payments free. And that is a core requirement to build a financially inclusive society with strong financial inclusion. Because you cannot charge people to move that money around. So I hope that answers the question.